the camera wars, they kind of never stopped. And with the arrival of Sony over a decade ago, everything really ramped up. But in 2024, are we now finding ourselves in a place where there's absolutely no wars to be had? Now, interestingly, I feel like Sony threw down the gauntlet with their global proposal. I have a little bit of a feeling that it hasn't landed exactly how they said in their own launch event. 24.6 is that sweet spot, especially for global shutter. It gives us global shutter without compromise. People said, you're going to compromise ISO. You're going to compromise dynamic range. Well, we overcame that. We're Sony. We're the largest sensor manufacturer in the world. Of course we're going to do it. We're the only ones that can do it. And prior to the launch of the Sony A93, we all knew what the downsides of making sensors faster and faster. The faster you make them, the more we potentially risk dynamic range and high ISO. These have been issues in the past. Now, Sony on their launch said, we have not compromised dynamic range and we have not compromised ISO. These were interesting statements because it was like, okay, well, they've done something that nobody has ever done. The problem with these statements is it has now transpired. We're now two and a half, three months later, and whether it's DP review, Petapixel, and so on, many outlets have come out and said, indeed, global shutter. It's, it's amazing. The technology for a use case, if you have a use case that requires it, which is a niche use case, global is unequaled. It's unequaled at solving those specific problems. Absolutely. It is at the cost of dynamic range and higher ISO performance. No big deal, not the end of the world. For those that need global shutter, outstanding. And guess what? This technology is only going to get better, but not everybody needs it. With cameras like the A1, the R3, the Z8 and the Z9 in the market, which are all very fast sensors, the gap is closing very much between fast stack sensors and global sensors. And those cameras can freeze helicopter blades, they can freeze swinging golf clubs. So is there a global war or is the war over before it's started? My take on it is there's no war. We have cameras which all perform for the majority of individuals. They give us what we need. And I recently conducted a poll about frame rates and asked what frame rates do people in the real world, what do they think they need? Only 8% of respondents, and this is around 1,600, 1,700. And that's a large pool. And I'll tell you something interesting about data. The data hasn't changed. I first started looking at it when there was 50 respondents and it's almost stayed exactly the same from 50 respondents through to 1,600, 1,700. 92% of respondents don't require more than 30 frames per second. 92. Only 3% of respondents say they need 120 frames per second. Now the question simply was, in the real world, once you've taken your Ferrari for a spin around the track, in the real world, what are you actually going to use? The A93, it gave us 120 frames per second global, but global is niche and 120 frames per second is niche. This poll tells us that. And the reality is, for sports, you can get 120 frames per second with other brands in JPEG, for example. So it's not like you can't get it, it's just not raw. So. I don't think there's any war to be had there. And this dovetails me to the next war, which is now over, and that is frames per second. That's a war that's been fought between Nikon and Canon for years with their flagship cameras slowly going 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 frames per second. But then it stopped. I think the reason that it stopped is they actually couldn't go any faster mechanically. You just, you just can't get the movements any quicker. That's my best guess. Plus mirrorless arrived, which gave us a whole new set of parameters. And now we've got electronic shutters, which completely changed the game again. And referring back to that poll, the reality is, is that Sony is running the Sony A1 at 30 frames per second in RAW. There are a few caveats on that 30 frames per second on the A1. For example, the files are something like 12.7 or 12.9 bit. They're not 14 bit. 
they're close, but they're not quite there. And that actually makes a fair bit of a difference to the file size as you start to remove the bits. Th that's why we have 8-bit video, 10-bit video, 12-bit video, and so on. And the other thing is, is that speed, Sony's only, only a very specific selection of Sony's lenses autofocus at that speed and no third-party lenses focus at that speed. So yes, it can do it, but with some caveats around it. Otherwise, 20 frames per second, raw 14-bit, you've got that in your A1, your Z8, your Z9, and you've also got the R5 at that 45 megapixel mark doing the same thing. The 45 megapixel R5, the almost 46 megapixel Z8 and Z9, and the 50 megapixel A1, and the difference in actual long edge pixels between those is something like 300 pixels between each. It really makes no difference to image quality. They're all running essentially at the same sort of speed when you're talking 14-bit RAW with full autofocus. It's actually something that you want to use. The reality is they're all very much in the same place, and 92% of people do not want anything over 30 frames per second. So to me, the frame war is over. The autofocus war, it's been hard fought for decades. Before Sony was in this market, Canon and Nikon, they fought autofocus wars. And actually Canon won that war many decades ago putting out a whole new lens mount that was able to drive lenses that I believe, as with all of this stuff, just focused a little bit faster. But Nikon then changed the design of their lenses and the motors in their lenses and they caught up. Sony then brought a whole new level. When we went to mirrorless, it changed what cameras could see and how they did things and it changed how autofocus systems worked all together from when the first mirrorless cameras came from Canacone, as in Canon and Nikon, to join Sony. And you can get one of these hats on my store. Click on the links just below this video. There's Canacone hats, yes, rock and roll. When they arrived in the mirrorless space in 2018, that was when they had to start to chase what Sony was up to. Now, Sony's autofocus wasn't great in its first two generations, and by Gen 3, yes, very good, undeniable. Canon caught up next probably around the R5, maybe slightly before the R5, there was some firmware coming, I think, into the Canon R, which was improving it, but not making it at the same level. But of course, Canon got there, we know that for a fact, and we now know that Nikon got there as well with the XP7, Z8, Z9, and ZF. I've said it before and I'll say it again, depending on your use case, depending on how you set up your camera, depending on what you're shooting, depending on what lens you're using, at this point in time, all cameras, all of these brands, when you're dealing with their high-end new systems, they are focusing at similar levels. And I do not believe, even so people continue to talk about it and talk about it as if there are stark differences, I do not believe that there are. I recently saw quite a funny video with a review of the A9 III from a very large channel telling me how that the A9 III focus was best in class, yet strangely, I saw it jump out of focus. Every camera, every camera struggles depending on what you throw at it. And, and that's the reality. And if you want to create a scenario to make something fail, you can. The AF wars are absolutely over from my perspective. And finally, we have my favorite. Is it my favorite? It's probably my favorite. And that is the Pixel Wars. The Pixel Wars have been fought hard and long. Hard and long. <laughs> the Pixel Wars have been fought hard and they've gone for a very long time. And I just do think we've reached a plateau. You, you might have watched some of my videos in the past when I've talked about this, but that is that I believe the manufacturers, Canon, Nikon and Sony have all landed with cameras around a similar point, which is this 45 to 50 megapixels, which there's hardly any difference on the long edge between that, if you actually count the pixels. And I believe, based on the fact that photons, they're not going to change size. So unless there's a new major technological shift in how we collect 
those photons, physics that comes into play as to how many pixels you want to squeeze on a 35mm wafer. Let's just choose 35 as our benchmark. Now, it's not just about collecting the light because I do think with processing, we're going to be able to continue to improve noisy images. And I think that's already happening. We're already seeing that not only in Photoshop, but we're seeing it in camera with cameras like the ZF. But there's also issues of formats. Because our mirrorless cameras are video cameras as well, and, and we've got formats in the world that they need to adhere to to make all the ratios work. So, for example, we've, we had 1080p, we had 1080p televisions. 4K, 4K televisions, 8K, 8K televisions. The next step in the industry is 12K, and 12K, if I recall correctly, is somewhere around 80 megapixels. And right now, I think that's too much of a technological step. There's format reasons why we don't want to go any bigger. 45, the, 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 sensor that, the sensor that Nikon have and Canon have seem to fit 8K very well. And we see in, I think, the A1 a little bit of a crop when they're doing 8K because their sensor is a little bit more dense. It makes sense from a format size as well. And there's also issues like diffraction. The smaller we make the photo sites, more, the more diffraction becomes an issue. And what diffraction is, is as you close down your aperture beyond about eight, when you say on a 60 megapixel camera, like the Sony a7R 4 and 5, your image actually starts to become softer as you go eight, 11, 16, and so on. That's a third reason why further pixel density is not helpful and I think a fourth reason is most of us and again manufacturers have to make for the majority the majority of the time most of us don't need more than 45 46 or 50 megapixels we just don't it's actually a lot we were all doing great things with 6 and 12 megapixels 10 years ago 45 45 is is, is a huge amount for the majority of us and then there's data handling as well. So it's dealing with not only increased file sizes, but of course with increased frame rates, you're increasing data. So you've got all of these reasons why the megapixel war does not really need to continue. And then now we have on top of this AI and the fact that AI is allowing us to jump into Photoshop and just say double the size of my image at no penalty it looks fabulous and it's suddenly double and it's like using and another reason is pixel shift pixel shift in the zf is taking you from 24 megapixels to almost 100 megapixels yes it doesn't work in every situation but it works in some or you can just use ai and how long until that ai might be in our actual cameras so the megapixel war is over, the AF war is over, the frames per second war is over. I'm not sure there's going to be a global war. I don't think it's necessary. I think we've all got cameras that we love and need and we can choose now. We can choose whether we want to go a slower BSI non-stacked or we go stacked or we go global. And they're all, diff they're all just slightly different at different things. And the interesting thing about the global war, one point I wanted to make is that red, and the issue of dynamic range, RED has magically solved. They have just released an 8K global camera, which is the Raptor X. And it has 17 stops of dynamic range. It's outstanding. How they've done this, and Sony hasn't, what magic is it? Who makes this sensor? You would think if Sony is making the RED sensor, then why wouldn't Sony allow it to go in an A93 because the A93 is 24 megapixels and this red camera is somewhere around 45 megapixels, 46 megapixels. Why haven't they done it? My guess is, my guess is, and it's hard to know, but perhaps Sony don't make the red sensor. And Sony's statement in their launch was... Global shutter without compromise. People said, you're going to compromise ISO. You're going to compromise dynamic range. Well, we overcame that. We're Sony. We're the largest sensor manufacturer in the world. Of course we're going to do it. We're the only ones that can do it. But then the red camera comes out just a couple of months later. Way more diamond. Like, like I, I think the A93 had come in at something like 12, 
11 or 12 stops of dynamic range, 17 for the red. Yes, it's six times the price, but it's a cine camera, but we're talking about the technology and what we'd expect from Sony is for them to give us the best technology. Anyway, I'll leave those thoughts with you. You can contemplate what that all means. I'm not even sure what it all means. I've just started to think about that. But all these wars are over, and I think at the end of the day, it's a super positive thing for the fact that now all camera companies are actually fairly equal at this point in time, and now that they can focus on the things that they're they want to focus on. So it might be what sort of software are they going to give us? What sort of connectivity are they going to give us? What lenses are they going to give us? How are they going to continue to improve ergonomics? There's so many more nuanced areas now, which I'm hoping means less crazy headlines because the crazy headlines aren't helpful anyway. You know, let's get more dynamic range. Let's get better high ISO. Let's get better ergonomics. This is just a little chat absolutely fantastic to have you here i'd love to know your thoughts about all of these different wars ending personally i'm happy about it i think it's real and i think really it doesn't matter what system you buy into today they're all magnificent and you just choose the one that suits your use case which is what i was saying five years ago when i first started doing this stuff regularly all right it's been so good to see you, and if this is your first time here, I would love to see you again, so please do subscribe, please share, and please like. Now, I will go into the darkness.